uh, as the, the primary mode through which you see Lewis as a leader. Um, and then you give us examples of people using the verb lead about Lewis with things like he led me to faith. Um, he, le he leads me to new ideas or th those kinds of uses of the same word. Um, so how would you redefine, how does Lewis redefine leadership uh, for you as you look through his life and works? He broadened it, really, um, and sort of made me understand um, that leadership begins and ends with relationships. Um, and, um, and just like our personal relationships with God, um, you know, those things are very personal to us. And um, what you were talking about a minute ago is where people are yelling at you is very transactional, right? I do these... I do these tasks, you give me a paycheck, you know, no one's the wiser. <laughs> yeah, we, we finished that. Um, in the transformational, authentic, uh, and servant leadership models, um, you impact people on a deeper level to the point where they will change how they behave and how they see things. And what Lewis, and I, I mentioned this a lot in the book, but what Lewis did was he lived his life. He lived that lifestyle every day. Um, you know, he gave two-thirds of his income away um, to widows and, um, I mean, he basically was living off of hardly any money. <laughs> he didn't realize the first year that he started writing books and getting a popular that he had to pay taxes. And so he got that really hefty tax bill the first time. And so Owen Barfield, who's one of his friends, who was also a solicitor, uh, stepped up and said, here, I'll make it account for you so you, because you're not real good with money. Um, and Lewis wasn't great with math, as we all know. <laughs> so um, what really what really impacted me was how C.S. Lewis did not intend to be a leader, but he lived that lifestyle, and he lived what he believed. And because he did that, other people came to Christ through that influence. Um, and I think that's the most powerful thing you can do is be, you know, be a, a, an ambassador for Christ. Um, so much so that other people say, I want that. I want what you have. So would you say that you're one of those influenced by him? And, and in what ways did this theater Lewis lead you? Well, um, several things. Um, I'm, a, I'm an English lit nerd. Um, <laughs> um, my bachelor's is from the University of Tennessee uh, in English literature. So I actually first encountered Lewis, I, I first encountered him in mere Christianity. Um, a lot of people thought that I first encountered him through the Chronicles of Narnia because of my age. Um, they're like, oh, you must read Narnia. I actually don't remember reading Narnia until I was 30. Um, <laughs> and by then it was, you know, it was, it was like, wow, I was still enthralled by it. But um, yeah, you know, I was, first of all, I, I think I was really drawn to the fact that he, his intellect and his imagination were combined. Um, and he gave me permission to ask the difficult questions about my faith that I had, you know, been previously scared to approach. Um, and he gave me confidence to say, yeah, go ahead. God's big enough. Go ahead and, and talk about those things. One of the things I love about Christianity is that he goes to those places and says, I dare you to ask these questions, right? Um, the reason you have a longing is because God made you for that longing. That's why you have that, right? Um, it's, it's so well done. I mean, Mary Christianity is one of those, you know, I took it to a Desert Island books, you know. <laughs> like I, would, I, can, I can read it a hundred times. It's still marvelous to me. But um, so I, I, I connected with him on a spiritual level because he gave me permission to ask those questions about my own faith. But also, as a literature person, um, you know, I was actually really interested in his work um, on literary criticism. Um, that was something that was uh, like a hidden gem for me because um, books like A Preface to Paradise Lost are marvelous. They're just marvelous pieces of work, allegory of love. Like they're, they're such studies and words. They're really good pieces of literary criticism that he underpins them with like sort of religious worldviews. Uh, and I just thought that was brilliant. And it was bold for that time in the academy um, for him to, to be making claims like that. Um, because um, as we mentioned, I think Malcolm was talking about this the other night. I mean, he was, he was denied many positions at the college because he was a popular apologist and people didn't like that. Um, you know, and I mentioned in the book here, you know, he could have just published all those works under a pseudonym mm -hmm. and then carried on with his professional work and had those two se separate spheres, but that to him was inauthentic. You know, he, he'd do better work if he was honest. And that was something he 
You know, he, he demanded that he was, you know, he be honest. There's an interesting overlap with uh, our visiting Bigner lecturer, Jeff Monroe, who points out that Frederick Bigner was uh, in the same kind of in-between world, somebody who was uh, initially drawn into the literary establishment and then pushed back because of his faith. And so he found himself kind of between worlds in a way that I think Lewis probably did too. Um, did you find, it, it seems to me a kind of interesting balancing act between reading a lot of literature about leadership, which is typically not thrilling, and then you're reading novels and poetry and, and the sort of rich prose uh, of Lewis. How did you find uh, overlap or, or was there tension between those two kinds of reading? Um, through Lewis's lens, I don't think there was tension um, because he was very intentional about the way he lived um, and he, you know, he didn't care for those theories. You know, at the time that Lewis was alive, um, leadership theory was relatively new. Um, the only thing that was really around was the great man leadership theory, um, which is a ridiculous set of notions about leadership. Like, you're, you have to be tall, you have to be attractive, you have to have, a, like, a booming voice, you have to be charismatic, you know, all these things that were, that have nothing to do with influence <laughs> and everything to do with the outside. So, um, you know, he was very much like, that's not me, I'm not even close to that. Um, and I talk about uh, in, the, in the, the, the introduction sort of how he, he even questioned himself as a young man. He was like, there's no way I could be a, you know, I could be a schoolmaster. I can't, I can't push those kids around. I can't do that. And um, so it was interesting. You know, you would think it, it did, but you know, when I read Good to Great, um, which, is, which is a great book on leadership, he sort of talks about the fact that humility is an important part of leadership. Um, and interpersonal relationships are an important part of leadership. Um, and those are things that um, being a good Christian is, is, is good for, but also being an effective leader is good for. Um, so, you know, I, depending on who you were reading the leadership theory through, uh, <laughs> I would see that. But people like James McGregor Burns, who is a great leadership theorist, actually coined the term transformational leadership. Um, and he, he says, you know, if you want to be a good leader, it's not skin deep. You, there's a lot of layers to this, and to be effective, uh, you have to you have to live it and believe it and act it out, behave it. Um, what did you find yourself drawing on from C.S. Lewis the most? Was it his biography? Was it the novels? Was it uh, apologetics? What were the what were the sources that turned out to be most significant for you in writing the book? Um, for me, mere Christianity was important. Um, the problem of pain was important. Um, his letters were a significant source for me um, because at, at the time, I'm sure he wasn't thinking, here, I'm going to write this and, you know, 100 years later, someone's going to be reading this, uh, reading all this stuff. But um, his everyday commitment to, to the Christian living is absolutely demonstrated through his letters. Absolutely demonstrated through his letters. So they were in there a lot, but mere Christianity, I felt, was so important because he talks about some of those major things like charity, um, you know, faith, love. All those things are discussed in various chapters on what we now call mere Christianity, which is uh, was a set of three uh, different uh, speeches that he made on the BBC during World War II. Um, so he actually he actually sees mere Christianity as a primer, sort of, for um, so uniting Christians on a very basic level to the things they believe because he saw even back then for, for through two world wars a splintering that was happening in the Christian faith and he said you know I want to draw these people back together under the banner of their belief um, and um, you know it was for, for me I mean for, and I think it's resonant today even um, that that type of unifying unifying that divide uh, that denominational divide and bringing people together um, is so important and it's part of you know what? And he had his own opinions about things, but he didn't talk about them. He was very, very, you know, explicit about not, you know, even I mean, he turned down the CBE, uh, right? He was offered a command of the British Empire and turned it down um, because he said it's going to make me look really bad. <laughs> it's going to make me look like I'm being political, and I don't want to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to end up alienating people, um, and people are going to think it's a political move. And I, I, so he turned that down. So, because um, he didn't want it to sort of hurt his testimony. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, his, his, I think Mary Christianity was, was a big one. That was the one, because I had to do my word counts for each book. Um, 
Um, if you quote Lewis, you know, you have, you have a certain word count you have to hit, or the, you know, the estate um, gets mad. <laughs> and um, Mere Christianity was one of those ones I had to keep. I had to go back and you know, carve a few words out or you know, summarize a little bit more, because it's, it's just so, it's brimming with so much wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just good wisdom, and it hits all, all the major traits that we were talking about throughout the book. Do we have to have read a lot of Lewis to get into the book, or is it ready for us to dive into? No, um, actually, I tried very, very hard to um, uh, to make this uh, as accessible to everyone, um, even if you're not a you know, you've only read *Mere Christianity*, *Screw Tape Letters*, and *Great Divorce* or something. You know, um, I, I contextualize all of those works so that, that you're able to read that and understand that. And I've actually added some footnotes in at different points, you know, just to, like, there's a footnote about the inner ring, which is a great essay by Lewis um, about sort of the, the small groups and the, you know, all the, you know, stuff that can happen, in prejudice, prejudicial things that happen in small groups. And um, so I've footnoted some of those things just to, you know, make people aware. And those footnotes are actually on the bottom of the pages. So, um, so you don't have to flip, flip, flip. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we wanted to make that available so you could just sort of cast your eyes down a little and, and get that information. But I, I approached this as I approached it with my, my dissertation, which was um, my, dis my doctoral committee was like, we, we haven't read a whole lot about it, but it sounds really interesting. So I sort of approached it with the same attitude as in like, here, you know, here's this great guy we know a lot about, but we don't know a lot about. Um, so let's contextualize these things and bring it to the table and talk about his life and his works um, under you know, these common traits. Okay. So what is your hope for the book? Where do you see it? What do you envisage for it? Who, who is uh, really going to be touched by this or moved by it? Well, um, I hope everyone, I mean, that wants to. <laughs> I mean, that's my hope. But, um, you know, my, I, I, like, when I wrote the book, um, I intentionally asked for it to be to laymen. Like I, 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 I intentionally wrote it for laymen um, because Lewis was a layman, um, and I wanted us to understand as the body of Christ how profound an impact we can have on people when we live out the gospel. Um, period. Full stop. And um, you know, I was talking the other day to uh, at, I was in Montreal. A few days ago, and I was talking to Steve Elmore, who is the president of the C.S. Lewis Foundation, and we were talking about, you know, um, the state of the church and things. And um, we had heard this uh, really frightful um, statistic that for every one, this is young people, I think like 45 and under, for every one person that joins the church, four leave. Um, in that age group, and um, so we were talking about, you know, how what can we do to combat that? Like, that's scary. Is the church shrinking? Is it diminishing? Like, what can we do to fix that? And, you know, looking back on Lewis, they were facing the same thing. But it was due to a war. And it was due to, you know, um, shortages. And, you know, I mean, there were so many things that happened. You know, the Great Depression and the <laughs> stock market crash. And there were so many things that were happening there. Um, and they still kept the optimism about their faith. Um, and so, and so I, I was looking, I was like, well, we can pull something from that too. And so from my book, I just want people to understand what a profound impact they can have on other people by living out the gospel and, ha and embodying those traits um, and living out, because that's what we need in culture now. We cannot do en masse group change. It's individual change. Mm -hmm. Person, person, person. That's how Lewis did it. You know, he wrote everybody. I mean, can you imagine this? He wrote every single person who wrote him a letter. He, he replied. Every single person. Can you, I mean, look at your inbox right now. Can you imagine writing back to every single person <laughs> that, that wrote you an email? I mean, it's, you know, he spent two to three hours a day writing letters back. Um, minimally. Sometimes longer. Um, he wasn't cheerful about it. Um, <laughs> he said he was like an he was like an oar to a galley slave. His pen was, but um, you know he he did it because he felt it was his duty to do that. Um, because the, he said this person took the time out of their day to write me a letter. The least I can do is respond. Um, and he became a spiritual mentor that way for many people. 
Um, so when I look at those things and we look at how Lewis impacted people, it's, it's on an individual level, right? It's people reading Mere Christianity and saying, oh, this guy gets it, you know, just like I did. <laughs> you know, my first copy of Mere Christianity, which I passed on to a student um, a few years ago, was probably, it was just highlighted, margin noted. I'm one of those people that does that to books. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if that, <laughs> if you hate that. But like, um, I highlight and margin note, uh, you know, and all this stuff. And it was every page was enlightening to me. It was just, it, it was a new experience. And I was like, man, I, what is this guy written? I have to go buy every book. And then I realized that a lot of them were out of print. And uh, <laughs> some of them cost like $100. <laughs> but I did eventually get on them. I think in 2019, I got the, I got the other room torso, uh, which was the last one I needed. Um, so I have everything he's, uh, he's written now, including uh, Beyond the Bright Blur, which was a little thing that went out that was uh, Letters to Malcolm. There's a small version of that, and Rehabilitations, and some of the other, other ones. Um, so, yeah, I think um, what we need to do in 2022 is embrace our call to be ambassadors for the kingdom um, and live out these traits because we are leaders in our own, you know, I mean, and that was one of the things that, I, that the leadership class really taught me. If you're, a, if you're a parent, you're a leader. If you're a teacher, you're a leader. If you're a mentor, you're a leader. If you're a pastor, you're a leader. If you're a youth worker, you're a leader. If you're a coach, you're a leader. <laughs> you know, it it's may not be a huge group of people, but um, you are making an impact on those people. And um, as a teacher, I noticed that students, I asked my students a few years ago to write about their heroes. And I expected celebrities and athletes, you know, film stars and stuff like that. What I got mainly was parents, grandparents, coaches, youth pastors. You know, these are the people they called them heroes. It was like people who poured into them and were good role models for them. So I think if we do that in our individual places all over, um, in our groups and our families, you know, um, we, can, we can do radical change in our culture. And that's what is going to put people back in pews in the churches. It's Christ's radical love working through us. Well, for those of you who just trickled in, uh, we just finished a little book launch, which we're going to finish at the end of the event. Uh, this is Crystal Hurd, who teaches at Virginia High School, and her book is The Leadership of C.S. Lewis. It will be available at the back uh, afterwards. We'll take a very short break now, and then we're going to get started with Jeff Monroe. So thank you, Crystal. Thank you. I'm pastor here at Central Presbyterian Church, and glad you are here. We always love hosting the King Institute of Faith and Culture. Um, and when Martin called and asked me to, to ask if we could host this, he said, I am desperate. I need something. I'm like, yes, but I understand it is Holy Week. And I'm like, it is a crazy week for me, but it's understandable, so we're good. So, But Bigner is one of those people who just, I went to Princeton and got to listen, hear him lecture in New York several times. He came to Princeton to lecture, so very wonderful, wonderful influence on my life. Um, important thing that you probably want to know, where are the bathrooms? The bathrooms are down this hall. To the left is the first door on the left is the men's. Second door on the left is the women's. Um, and we are just glad you're here. If you need me, I'm on the sound booth. And um, welcome, Mark. Well, I'm delighted to have you here this evening for the Frederick Buechner Lecture. This is something that is an annual event for the King Institute for Faith and Culture, and one we have uh, enjoyed for many, many years with a number of great writers. Uh, it's especially great tonight to have the Buechner Lecture focus on somebody who has done so much work on Frederick Buechner in the person of Jeff Monroe. And so this is a, while he's going to be telling us about a different project, he is steeped in the words and wisdom of Frederick Buechner. I had a great time talking to Jeff earlier today. Uh, we recorded some conversation between us about the way that he has been shaped by Buechner's work. So it really is a good way for us to honor the work 
and the witness of Frederick Wiener. Um, to that end, at the end of the session tonight, you have the opportunity to purchase Jeff Monroe's book, uh, Reading Wiener, which is a very personal, very accessible account of the works of Frederick Wiener and how they have shaped Jeff over the years. Um, appropriate for Christmas gifts, birthdays, Absolutely. multiple copies. You might want to have a spare for the car. You want to get a couple of these, so be sure to pick up a copy of these. We also have, thanks to the Beatner family, a number of Fred's own books uh, for sale uh, inexpensively at the back. If you want to pick up a book or two by Beatner, we have quite a few here with us. We also have the opportunity uh, tonight to purchase Crystal Hurd's new book, The Leadership of C.S. Lewis. She's at a separate table back there, and I just had a chance to talk to her a little bit at the front, which you may or may not have caught. Uh, this is our final event for the year. It's been a very good year for the King Institute for Faith and Culture. We've had a few stops and starts with the coronavirus, but we've had a lot of rich discussion. <coughs> um, we have, I think, in, in every way fulfilled the vision of Dale Brown, who saw this as, a, as creating a space for conversation, creating a space for friendship about things that matter, allowing us to use words redemptively and beautifully as opposed to uh, using them as missiles, as we are so often apt to do. And so I am pleased to finish this year's series, which is titled Listen to Your Life, which we borrowed from Frederick Wiener with Jeff Monroe. Jeff is a graduate of Michigan State University. He attended Western Theological Seminary and worked for many years for Young Life in administrative capacities, uh, including some in Europe. He, has, uh, he then went and was an administrator. He was vice president at Western Theological Seminary, his alma mater, before retirement uh, with COVID a couple of years ago, swanning off into uh, a full-time writing career. Jeff has done a lot of writing of different kinds. He's written a number of poems, which you can find in a variety of different magazines. He has written uh, some fiction, which he told me has never seen the light of day. <laughs> Um, and he's written uh, a number of essays. If you go to the Reformed Journal online, that's a publication that he edits, and he also contributes regularly to its online blog, The Twelve. Um, so in addition to reading Beatner, he's done a lot of other writing as well, uh, informed by Beatner, informed by many other uh, sources, and always worth reading. Uh, Jeff reminds me in so many ways of our founder, Dale Brown, because both bring an immense amount of learning and wisdom, and they put it in a way, in, in words that are completely accessible. There's nothing that is pretentious or difficult. This is a welcoming kind of use of language. And I saw that so much with Dale, and certainly with Jeff as well. And I'm delighted to have him tonight. Please join me in uh, welcoming Jeff Monroe. And um, all this talk about Frederick Buechner in my book about Buechner, I'm actually not going to really talk that much about Frederick Buechner tonight. <laughs> I talked about him this morning. I talked about him yesterday. Um, so I've done all the Buechner I need to do. Um, maybe. We'll see. Um, I told his life story a little bit this morning. I talked about why he's meant so much to me. I told a personal story that begins my book, Reading Buechner. I'm not going to repeat that story tonight, but only say that it was resolved by reading an essay of Frederick Buechner's called Adolescence and the Stewardship of Pain. And that concept, that idea of the stewardship of pain, has been my inspiration for the last couple of years. I've um, been working on a new book that I'm um, calling, tentatively entitled, Make This Wound Your Medicine, Stories of Resilience, Hope, and the stewardship of pain. And so this morning I read a Beatner quote about the power of our stories. And I love this quote so much, I, I am going to repeat this quote tonight for you. My story is important, Beatner writes, not because it is mine, God knows, but because if I tell it anything like right, the chances are you will recognize that in many ways 
it is also yours. Nothing is more important than we keep track, you and I, of these stories of who we are and where we have come from and the people that we have met along the way because it is precisely through these stories in all their particularity, as I've long believed and often said, that God makes himself known to each of us most powerfully and personally. If this is true, it means that to lose track of our stories is to be profoundly impoverished, not only humanly, but also spiritually. Isn't that a great quote? So if you like that, and like Beekner, get those books back there by him, and then by mine too, because mine is designed as, a, as an introduction to Beekner for those of you that may know the name but really haven't um, engaged with it. But what I'm going to do tonight is um, share from my new book with you. And what I do in this book is I, I tell someone's story in the first part of each chapter, and then I talk with another person that can bring wisdom and insight into that story. So the first story is a story of loss, of trauma of some sort. Um, and, the, and the part I'm going to share with you tonight tells the story of someone who's actually been here before to uh, the King Institute, um, a man named Nicholas Walter Stork. Don't know if you're familiar, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about who he is. And then I process it with someone else who's been here before as one of your speakers, an artist named Mako, Makoto Fujimura. Um, and I'll give you more detail about them as we go. So um, Nick, as you'll see, is one of the most impressive thinkers in the world. And he's really helped me understand the stewardship of pain. And um, I'm really trying to build on Beekner. It's a very Beekner-esque book that I'm writing. But I'm going to go in a direction that's not so much about Beekner tonight. And you are the first break people that I've ever shared this with. So if this stinks, you tell me. And we'll just kill it right here. Right here and now. This will be the end of it. Thank you for signing up to be guinea pigs. But I'm, so, you know, there's, there's this question and answer time set aside afterwards. But actually, it's me that wants to ask questions of you. I am really interested in what you think and how this strikes you. So. This chapter is called Nick, Eric, and Mako. Nicholas Waltersdorf has a formidable presence, undimmed at age 89 with a full head of white hair. He possesses a serious, distinguished manner befitting the Noah Porter Professor Emeritus of Philosophical <coughs> Theology at Yale University. <laughs> He holds two advanced degrees from Harvard University. Harvard University, in addition to Yale, was a faculty member at both Calvin College and the Free University of Amsterdam, and a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia. Nick, and I use first names throughout my book, but in his case, it's really tempting to go with Dr. Waltersdorf all the way through. But if you meet him, anybody that knows him Calls him Nick. He insists on that. Well, he's delivered named lecture series at several universities around the world, including Oxford, St. Andrews, Princeton, Yale. Uh, he created, was part of creating the Society of Christian Philosophers. And he's written 25 books on subjects like just easy things to pick up, epistemology, ontology, art and aesthetics, justice, political philosophy, and metaphysics. And yet for all that, he's probably best known for a very slim volume that he wrote called Lament for a Son, published in 1987 following the death of his son, Eric, in a climbing accident in Austria. So Eric was 25 years old at the time of the accident. He'd been a bright child, he excelled at school, he was adventuresome and curious. When he was going into his senior year of high school on his own, he arranged to take a summer course in ceramics at Alfred University in New York. A 
between his sophomore and junior years of college, he traveled to Japan with a bunch of friends and just freestyled through the country. Uh, in addition to his skill with ceramics, he was a very talented musician. He'd studied computer programming. He was excelling as a graduate student at Yale. And he was supervising the discussion sections for 700 undergraduate students in the introductory art history course. And at age 24, he curated his own show at the Yale British Art Museum. And his dissertation was focusing on the work of a modern German architect. And so in order to best study that work, um, he had moved to Munich. And that also put him closer to the Alps, which he absolutely loved. He loved mountain climbing. And he died doing what he loved. Climbing solo fit his venturesome personality. He took risks. He did things independently. He was always moving ahead. His dad said, I'd always criticize him for driving too close to the car in front of him. That's just the way that he was. He died on June 11th, 1983. And when Eric's German landlady called and said that Eric was dead, his father said, I had an image of holding my son's limp body in my arms. And then he felt intense cold and burning pain. So Nick Waldersdorf traveled to Europe to claim his son's body and retrieve his possessions. And on the way home, he had eight hours in the Luxembourg airport. And he said, I brought some things to read. I couldn't read. So I took out some paper and I started to write. I'm a writer. That's what I do. And although he doubts a single sentence he wrote in the Luxembourg airport, eventually made it into lament for his son, the book's genesis happened that day. And instead of writing about grief, Nick simply expressed his grief. The book, he would say, is a cry of grief. So here's some lines from it. Sometimes I think happiness is over for me. My life is divided into before and after. What do I do now with my regrets? The pain of the no more outweighs the gratitude of the once was. Will it always be so? I didn't know how much I loved him until he was gone. His love like that. Giving voice to grief through lament is mostly an ignored practice in the church. It hasn't always been that way. Many of the psalms are psalms of lament. They ask, how long? And why do you hide your face? And why have you forgotten me? The lament of Psalm 102 uses desperate poetic language. For my days pass away like smoke and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is stricken and withered like grass. I'm too wasted to eat my bread because of my loud groaning. My bones cling to my skin. Lament raises its voice to say that something is terribly wrong. Something is not the way it's supposed to be. And modern American church is either caught up in celebration and praise or repeating the cycles of guilt and forgiveness rarely practice lament. And so lament for a son reintroduced this ancient practice. Eric's death wounded Nick, and the book expresses the pain of that wound. We had plans with Eric, his father said. His brother was going to spend the summer in Munich with him. We loved hearing from Eric, talking with Eric, and now all of that was gone, leaving a gaping void in its place. There's a hole in the world now in the place where he was. There's now just nothing. The world is emptier. My son is gone. Only a hole remains a void, a gap, never to be filled. In a sort of mockery, Eric's backpack and climbing boots were unharmed. And the authorities in Austria, <coughs> however, suggested not looking at the body. And so later, when, when, they had, when Nick had gotten home, Nick's wife, Claire, insisted that they see and that they touch Eric's body. She was right, Nick said. We saw him from the torso up. Perhaps his lower body was mangled, but it was important to touch him and to see him. 
Not only are dead bodies disappearing from funerals in our death-denying culture, but funerals are disappearing and being replaced by celebrations of life. We want to glide past death and not reckon with the bodies of the dead. Yet there is something elemental and primal about touching and seeing the dead. As Nick wrote, I pity those who never get a chance to see and feel the deadness of the one they love, who must think death but cannot sense it. To fully persuade us of death's reality and of its grim finality, our eyes and hands must rub against death's cold, hard body, body against body, painfully, knowing death with mind alone is less than fully known. And true to his academic nature, Nick soon collected a pile of books on grief so he could understand what was happening, but then he found he couldn't read them. I was not interested in death, he said. I was interested in Eric's death. And one of Nick's friends, Lou Smeads, who's a, also a very well-known uh, writer, was on the faculty at Fuller for many years, gave some invaluable advice. Lou Smead said that you've heard there is company in misery, Nick said, but he told us that wasn't true. He said grief isolates. That gave us the understanding and freedom to experience grief individually and at our own pace. Claire might be deep in grief on a day I felt like working in the garden, or vice versa. Each of our children grieved differently. We had a common source of grief but my grief was not their grief. Lament for a son has no chapters. There's no linear or narrative, continuous flow to it. Its ragged nature reflects the ragged nature of grief. There's a lot of white space in the book, and Nick uses white space the way a poet uses white space. Room is created for readers to supply their own thoughts. And over the years, Nick came to see the white space as silence, because not every feeling can be expressed with words. He did not write the book like he would typically write a philosophical book. He didn't examine grief in a detached, scholarly manner. He simply described his feelings. The words just came to me, he said. He wrote in pictures. One of the most memorable lines is, sorrow is no longer the islands, but the sea. And he resolved not to include any pious platitudes or false reassurance, only his absolute, honest feelings. I initially thought there was something unique about me because I had lost a child, Nick said. But I soon learned I had a lot of company on the mourner's bench. Since the publication of the book, he's heard from hundreds and hundreds of grieving parents. And the circle soon widened and began hearing from people who had experienced loss of any kind. One day, Nick ran into a, a friend, a businessman, in an airport who was reading Lament. Nick said, this man, a prominent businessman, had experienced no tragic loss that I knew of. I asked why he was reading my book. And he said he was rereading it after giving copies to all four of his children. I wondered why, and he said, don't you see, Nick, that it's a love song? And I suppose it is. Nick initially wrote as his own therapeutic exercise, but as time passed, he began to think his thoughts might be helpful to others. I began to wonder if there might be something redemptive that could come out of this experience, if what I was writing might somehow make something redemptive. I resolved not to disown my grief, but to seek to own it redemptively. Own it in such a way that might bring about some good. Henry Nowen was among the people that praised the book, writing, this little book is a true gift to those who grieve and those who in love reach out to comfort. Walter Storff's words are indeed salve on our wounds. Thank God he did not remain silent, but still Nick had doubts about what he was doing. He happened to be at the printing plant of the William B. Erdman's company, the book's publisher, and he saw a pallet with hundreds of copies of the book stacked on it in preparation for shipping. An image came to him. He saw himself lying on a stretcher 
or maybe a hospital bed or in a casket with his intestines exposed as people file past gawking at him. And he wondered, what have I done? Despite his initial misgivings, the book has become the most popular pastoral theology book ever published by Erdman's. It has sold exponentially more than all the other books Nick has written on philosophy combined. And as time has passed, Nick has thought deeply about what grief is and about God's relationship to those who are suffering and about death. And in 2012, he spoke on befriending the grieving to hospital chaplains in Dallas. In 2016, on living with grief at the Mayo Clinic. And many of his thoughts were included in a, in a chapter that he entitled Living with Grief um, in his memoir, In This World of Wonders, which is published in 2019. And over the years, he concluded that grief is rooted in love, particularly what he called attachment love. Attachment love is different than the love we feel for things like music or art that attracts us, different from the love we feel like activities like gardening or playing the piano. Attachment love is deeper, more mysterious, a love that desires the well-being and flourishing of the beloved. Grief occurs when the object of one's attachment <coughs> dies, disappears, or is destroyed. Grief wants the impossible. It wants the loved one back. Grief is the state of wanting what has been done to be undone, while simultaneously knowing that that cannot happen. In this way, grief is not rational. But it's not pathological. It may become pathological. Nick told me a story of a lawyer he knew who had lost a child and gone back to work exactly one week later. He said, that man is an emotional wreck. But grief is not necessarily pathological. Instead, Nick sees grief as admirable, saying that if your child or your spouse or your parent, whoever it is that you've lost, was worth loving when alive, then he or she is worth grieving over when dead. So Western society is fixated on what Nick calls disowning grief. He points out the language we use to put it behind us, to get over it, to get on with your life, as language of disowning. The goal of grieving is, it, it, though he says, is not to move on from it, to somehow overcome it. The goal is to own it <coughs> and to take it in to your being. And as time passes, the goal shifts not only from owning one's grief, but owning it redemptively, to use it to help others. Surely, this is what Frederick Beekner means when he speaks of the stewardship of pain. So much has been written about stages of grief, with grief being described as a process one goes through with the end result that one can move on to the rest of, of, of one's life, and Nick rejects those ideas. I used to have people come see me in my office, he said, who had experienced loss and were frustrated because they weren't experiencing the stages of grief. They thought something was wrong with them. There wasn't anything wrong with them other than their belief that grief comes in stages. I read a few lines to Nick from something I found online that was instructing preachers in how to talk to their congregants about suffering. The gist of it was that suffering and death are tools that God uses to shape and mold us. The article spoke about meekly submitting to the rod of the Father and being quiet under God's smiting rod because it is training for holiness. And although the language of this particular article seemed archaic and extreme, there is a Christian tradition of viewing suffering as God's tool for soul making. And I asked Nick what he thought of that. I find that grotesque and repugnant, he said. What did Eric's untimely death do for, my, for Eric's soul? And the idea that God would cause Eric's foot to slip for my moral and religious improvement is grotesque. 
I may have grown deeper through my suffering, but to suggest that God employs the death of children to improve their parents mm -hmm. is repugnant. Mm -hmm. 38 years after Eric's death, Nick still grieves for his son. The pain is not as intense, but it remains. The hole never closes. He said, you repair it, but it does not close completely. How could it? Am I supposed to forget Eric? So I first read Lament for a Son in the late 1980s, not long after it was published. And one of my takeaways was the assertion that God is appalled by death. Nick writes that the biblical view is not that death is something God uses for our good. The biblical, the Bible instead speaks of God's overcoming death. Paul calls it the last great enemy to be overcome. My pain over my son's death is shared by God's pain over my son's death. And yes, I share in God's pain over his son's death. And as the book goes on, my impression is that Nick does actually write more philosophically and theologically toward the end of it. And he confirmed this, noting that on the final, the final pages reflect his thinking many months after Eric's death. So he writes, for a long time I knew that God is not the impassive, unresponsive, unchanging being portrayed by classical theologians. I knew of the pathos of God. I knew of God's response of delight and of his response of displeasure. But strangely, his suffering, I never saw it before. God is not only the God of the sufferers, but the God who suffers. The pain and fallenness of humanity have entered into his heart. Through the prism of my tears, I have seen a suffering God. It is said of God that no one can behold his face and live. I always thought this meant that no one could see his splendor and live. A friend said perhaps it meant that no one could see his sorrow and live. Or perhaps his sorrow is his splendor. Well, words like impassive and pathos lead into the realm of philosophers and theologians. Divine impassibility is the idea that God does not experience emotions and is immune from pain and pleasure. This has been the official doctrine of the church over the centuries. Proponents of this view argue that an emotional God becomes subject to other beings and therefore cannot be God. Nick rejects divine impassibility, saying its origins are, are not found in the Bible but in the writings of first century Greek philosophers. Divine pathos describes a full range of human emotions, perhaps most forcefully articulated by Abraham Joshua Heschel in his great book, The Prophets. Divine pathos draws from scriptures that speak of God's delight, God's anger, and God changing his mind. Instead of explaining our suffering, Nick writes, God shares it. Knowing that his views on divine impassibility and divine pathos have not changed over the decades. I asked Nick how his view of God has changed over the decades. He said this, before Eric's accident, my God was too domesticated. God is much more mysterious than I ever thought and ever imagined. Faith is a footbridge that you don't know will hold you up over the chasm until you're forced to walk out onto it. I still trust God, but I no longer trust God to protect me and my family from harm and grief. He wrote that perhaps if Eric had not died, he would have taken up the philosophical and theological challenge of the problem of people. But such an exercise does not appeal to him given what he'd experienced. He said, I do not shy away from taking note of the gaping void in me that Eric's death caused. I do not shy away from voicing my lament over his death. But I could not bring myself to trying to figure out what God was up to. I joined the psalmist in lamenting without explaining. Things have gone awry in God's world. I do not understand why 
nor do I understand why God puts up with it for so long. Rather than Eric's death evoking in me an, an interest in theodicy, which is the classical understanding or que question of why is there evil in the world, it had the effect of making God more mysterious. I live with the mystery. Nick maintains that God's ultimate desire for humanity is best expressed by the word shalom. And although often translated as meaning peace, shalom means more than that. It means uh, really along the lines of the famous remark of Martin Luther King Jr. when he said that true peace is not the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. Walter Starr says the best word for shalom may be flourishing. So I ask them what's the relationship between grief and shalom. Many things upset and rupture shalom, and God is sad about those things. The death of a child upsets the order of shalom. It's wrong. Eric was supposed to bury me, not the other way around. Grief is a breach in shalom. Grief is incompatible with full shalom. As one learns to live around the gap in one's life that grief represents, as one learns to own one's grief redemptively. There's healing of the breach, but the fact that grief never fully disappears means that in this life, the healing of the breach of shalom is never complete. So a few years ago, Nick was invited to participate in what turned out to be the most impactful teaching experience of his life. Calvin University has established a new campus inside the Hamlin State Prison for Men outside of Ionia, Michigan, about 25 miles east of their main campus. And some inmates at Hamlin are full Calvin students earning bachelor's degree. Lament for a Son had been assigned as a textbook in an introduction to philosophy course. And Waltersdorf entered the prison to discuss the book. 17 of the 20 inmates in the class were serving life sentences. The inmates read passages from the book aloud and spoke of how it gave words to what they felt. They confessed what they had done. Nick said, one would say, I killed my best friend. Another would say, I murdered my wife. And so on. I had never experienced anything like it. I came to see the prisons are houses of lament, houses of grief. And I felt my common humanity with these men profoundly. And now uh, he returns to the prison annually to teach the book and discuss it with the inmates. So at age 89, Nicholas Walterstorff thinks about his own death. There are things he'd like to say to Eric, but he doesn't claim to know how God's new creation will work. I have no idea, he said. There are billions of people for God to deal with. I think about what's next, but I don't know what's going to happen. It's a mystery. And in the months following Eric's death, he, Nick found comfort in rereading T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, was especially struck by the line, in the end is my beginning. And he also found resonance with John Donne's sentiment that any man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. The paradox, the mystery, of in the end is my beginning, it parallels the paradox and mystery of owning grief and making it redemptive. And if any death diminishes, how much more the death of a beloved child. Nick was indeed wounded by the loss of Eric, but through lament for his son and his willingness to speak over the decades of his particular experience of grief, Nicholas Walterstorff has been an agent of love, compassion, and mercy and our broken battered the world. And at the end of Lament, he notes that the radiance which emerges, emerges from acquaintance with grief as a blessing to others is familiar, though perplexing. How can we treasure the radiance while struggling against what brought it about? How can we thank God for suffering's yield while asking for its removal? Until that day when God wipes away every tear from our eyes when mourning the time crying and pain are no more, and death is no more. We live in that mystery. 
Well, I thought long and hard about who to invite to comment, to process Nick's story with. I wondered who had the stature, actually. I was reticent to ask another philosopher or theologian. I feared I might wind up refereeing a debate about divine impassibility and divine pathos. And I actually said to myself, I've got to get creative and think creatively about this. And the word creative brought to mind a creative person. Makoto Fujimori. Mako is a visual artist who has lived, worked, and studied in both Japan and the United States. His paintings have been exhibited worldwide. He's also a deep thinker. He's written several books about the intersections and sometimes collisions between the worlds of art and faith. I was not surprised to learn that Mako and Nick know each other and that Nick, an art collector, actually owns a couple of Mako's paintings. They were very comfortable being paired together. I probably first read Lament for a Son close to 30 years ago, Mako said, and then after I experienced the trauma of 9-11 firsthand, my pastor gave Lament to me and I read it again. And then someone else gave it to me a while ago when I went through a divorce, so I read it again. People keep giving it to me. <laughs> I'm not sure how many times I've read it, 85. And I've also given several copies to people suffering pain or trauma or unexpected loss. Nick's words are powerful and intimate and speak more clearly than any discourse on pain. Yet I'm not sure Lament for a Son was my first exposure to Nick. I read his book, Art in Action, in the 1990s. And when we first met him, we participated in an academic conference together. I appreciate Nick's approach to art. Not only is he a great philosopher, but he's also a fine carpenter. He's from generations of people who use their hands to build their homes and furniture. His understanding of art as making is somatic. And although he is a very high level thinker, he translates philosophy to a deeply communal level, which is very helpful to someone like me who navigates an art world that is disembodied and even Gnostic, and a church world that is Gnostic as well when we lean into super-rationalized ways of understanding the gospel as information only. And not alone, many creatives are marginalized. We were just, you just mentioned that, Martin. And certainly that is Frederick Buechner's story as well. Nick brings an important connection between work with hands and art and speaks powerfully to us. Creativity and the art of creation, according to Mako, are gratuitous. And I tend to hear that word negatively, usually in reference to gratuitous violence or gratuitous sex in a movie. Yet if we suspend the negative connotation and simply hold on to gratuitous, meaning unnecessary, it opens new windows into the nature of God. Creation is unnecessary in the sense that although God by nature is creative, God doesn't need to create. Instead, God chose to create out of love. Creation, Mako writes, is a superfluous act of generosity. Part of the mystery of creation is what seems superfluous or unnecessary is actually vital. In God's upside-down economy where the first or last and the last first, the stone the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone. What's viewed as useless or unnecessary in the eyes of the world is crucial in the kingdom of God. Art is not useful or utilitarian. A painting or a poem does not do anything. In an industrialized world of production, artists are easily overlooked. There is a long list of great artists like Vincent Van Gogh and Emily Dickinson, who were ignored during their lifetimes. Could it be, Mako asks, that what is deemed marginal, what is useless in our terms, is most essential for God and is the bedrock, the essence of our culture? In a similar way, Mako said, the lent for a son is a gratuitous act of generosity drawn from Nick's experience. It breaks categorical realities of academia and publishing. It's not a book of philosophy, but it's written by a great philosopher. It wasn't useful or necessary 
for Nick's career as a philosopher. But it is an essential book, and it is the book of his that has reached the widest audience. I'm sure he made a costly sacrifice writing this book. No wonder he had that moment of seeing himself exposed and wondering what he had done when he saw copies of the book stacked up to be shipped. I know from personal experience that it's difficult to write about your own pain and trauma. Writing can help, but it also hurts. While it can be healing to put things down on paper, it's also re-traumatizing as you relive painful events. You're writing about things you wish had never happened, and you feel the weight of them over and over. And I think this is also an insight that really applies to Frederick Buechner and what he does with the pain and the events of his life. So this must have been hard for someone who is as deep a thinker as Nick is. His deep capacity for thought makes me appreciate his approach even more. He does not ask, why did my son die? Or enter into philosophical questions, which he is very capable of doing. Instead, he speaks straight from the heart. I see strong parallels with a verse that means a lot to me. John 11, 35, Jesus wept. The context of that verse is the death of Lazarus, the grief of his sisters Mary and Martha. Why would Jesus weep when he had the power to resurrect Lazarus? He knows he can fix the problem. And he could have come to them earlier when he first heard Lazarus was sick and healed him and avoided the pain altogether. Instead, Jesus chooses to enter into the pain and then chooses to stay in the lament. He stayed in the tears and grief of Mary and Martha and the community that was suffering. It's exactly the right thing to do, but Jesus didn't have to do it. And in his book, Art and Faith, Mako writes, Jesus wept gives us a perspective on God's gratuitous compassion. And it highlights intuition and creativity as entry points into God's word. More and more, I am drawn to see all of scripture through this lens. We're used to hearing the Christian gospel as a victorious message. But when viewed through Christ's tears, the gospel may appear a bit upside down. We're used to being told that by following Christ, everything will be restored. In some cases, we're promised prosperity. Church programs seem to be dedicated to helping us improve our lives, have better marriages, become better parents. All of these good outcomes are not against God's design for abundance in the world. But John 11:35 adds complexity of this version of the good news. Certainly, the incarnate Christ experienced the full range of human emotions. His tears shed for our brokenness and pain, were also shed at the loss of our Eric Walter store. Japanese culture is more attuned to seeing the beauty in pathos than Western culture is. Japanese notions like wabi-sabi sees beauty in what is well-worn and used and even broken. And the Japanese phrase, mano no aware, describes the pathos of things wearing away. Although I mentioned I have no interest in referring a dispute about divine impassibility versus divine pathos, I believe divine impassibility is a doctrine that can only have arisen in the Western world. Early in the morning of September 11, 2001, Mako left his loft apartment in southern Manhattan, three blocks away from the World Trade Center. His children were in school that morning in the shadow of the Twin Towers. And after the attacks, Mako searched for hours to find his family. The subway train had to backtrack to avoid disaster. And while in the subway, he felt the rumble of the first tower falling. The subway train backtracked for two miles. And when Mako entered the subway, the Twin Towers were gone. But when he exited the subway, the Twin Towers were gone. I thought I lost my children that day, Marco said. To say it was traumatic is a great understatement. My family witnessed the devastation of my children are ground zero children. We saw that smoldering hole out the window of our apartment.
for months and looked out at ground zero for the next decade until we moved from that place. The amount of loss in New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C. is incalculable. 9-11 pushed me over the edge. In the months that followed T.S. Eliot's four quartets, the same poems Nick turned to after the death of his son became my guidebook. It became my map to navigate a really confusing time. Eliot's four quartets is the consummation of everything Eliot had ever written. He was so satisfied with the four quartets that he did not write another poem. It was the end of poetry for him. Some of the sections of the poems are very dark. They're really the nadir of Western poetry. And when you go through the darkness, as I did following 9-11, Eliot made absolutely the right sense to me. He spoke clearly to the darkness that I was going through. It's apparent he also spoke to Nick. Eliot pushes the boundaries of hope and the fact that Nick could conclude Lament for Son with Eliot's line from the four quartets, In My End is My Beginning, is extraordinarily hopeful. It's an amazing statement of faith to end with that line. It takes an enormous level of self-understanding and honesty to move through the purgatorial fires of pain to move away from disaffection and distraction and get to the other side. Eliot's poem does that. Nick does that by being brutally honest about the pain. And then, like Eliot, expressing hope that isn't simply a projection, hope that doesn't deny or lose the immediacy of the moment. In addition to painting, Mako practices the Japanese art of kintsugi. Kint, sugi, Masters repair ceramics used in Japanese tea ceremonies. Kent means gold, and sugi means to mend or reconnect. Using Japanese lacquer and gold to repair cracks and fractures, kintsugi masters do not just repair or restore broken teaware. They create something new. Ceramic bowls, which may have previously had a uniform, indistinguishable appearance, are transformed after the kintsugi process. They're all unique since no two pieces of ceramic break in the same way. Kintsugi is an art form akin to the theology of new creation, Mako said, that is so prevalent in the New Testament. After trauma to a bowl or a person, you will never return to the way things were. But something new can be created. Think of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. They're new creation moments. It's amazing that after all he suffered, he came back as a human being. He could have been anything. Yet he came back as not only a human, but a wounded human. He wasn't the same. People didn't recognize him immediately. This is the unimaginable reality of the new creation. Because miraculously, somehow, through those wounds, we are healed. A Kintsugi master does not start from the mindset of, oh, this is broken, let's fix it. A Kintsugi master will behold the fragment and say, this fragment is enough. This broken piece is enough. In that moment, they name and appreciate the fragment and may not even think of mending it for a while. It is a singular piece, and we can find beauty in that piece. We see in Kintsugi a process of looking at the brokenness, beholding it, naming the fractures, finding them beautiful, and then mending them in a way that accentuates the fractures instead of hiding them. Something new is created. Gold is poured in, and the new design is completely dependent upon the wounds. You could say of Kintsugi, in my end, is my beginning. What was broken is made into something new that can be used again. This is a profound message for us in the West. In the West, we quickly discard what is broken. When we seek to do Kintsugi in the United States, nobody has broken ceramics. They've already thrown them away. In addition to meaning to mend or reconnect, Sugi can also mean connecting to the next generation. The connotation of Kintsugi meaning to pass to the next generation is appropriate and poignant when thinking about Nick. 
Marco said, what does it mean to be a father when the absence of your son is so painfully real? Sometimes a Kintsugi master will not mend a bowl. Instead, the fragments are passed to the next generation, along with the story of who the bowl served and how it was broken. Mako told me, I have a Korean bowl that was taken to Japan and was used in high tea. It was made in the 17th century, broke in the 18th century. The fragments were held for two generations before it was given to a Kintsugi master to mend, and it was mended in the 19th century. There's a lesson in that. Some trauma is not possible to mend right away. It takes generations. Think of the Columbine High School families, or the 9-11 families, or the survivors of countless other ground zeros around the world. Sometimes all we can do is tenderly pass the fragments down. In this way, what Nick is doing in Lament for a Son is very Eastern. If he'd wanted to argue his way into suffering, he has the mind, maybe the best mind, to do that, but he chose not to. Instead, he beheld and named his emptiness, using the white space on the page to express that. His book is written like a hot food, spare, sparse, beautifully descriptive, beautifully written. As Mako spoke about creating something more beautiful from broken pieces through doing Kintsugi, I thought of a line from William Butler Yeats's poem, Crazy Jane Talks to the Bishop. Nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Kintsugi is that sort of bridge from creation to <coughs> creation. You can't undo the past, but you can mend it to make something new. That's the shift towards a Kintsugi life. A Kintsugi life embodies the stewardship of pain. People experience healing in our Kintsugi workshops. Our culture doesn't have language for lament. Yet everyone has some sort of trauma. For example, we've all been traumatized by the pandemic. After 2020 and 2021, we're all survivors. Our Kintsugi workshops have revealed that giving people simply de simple devices, and if they don't have something broken, we give them shells to work with as healing. They fill the cracks with putty, they sand it, they add gold, and it comes out beautiful, even the first time. Trauma therapists have told us that brain neurons get rewired as a person does the physical act of Kintsugi. They've said that it may take them six months of talk therapy to get where our Kintsugi workshops go in two hours. Mm. Something is awakened that our Western society with its utilitarian and industrialized realities has lost. We create space where it's safe to play and use your hands, simply sanding for a long time listening to sandpaper go over putty and ceramic is enormously healing. In our consumer society, we do all sorts of things to numb pain. But once you give people language and a way to redirect pain that's been surpassed, that's been suppressed, beautiful things happen. I spent the 20th anniversary of 9-11 doing Kintsugi. Mako said, I, I felt I could not go back down to ground zero. I'm not over 9-11. I'm still going through it. Many pieces may have been restored, but there are still hairline fractures. I'm grateful my children are doing well, and they were at ground zero for the 20th anniversary. That says a lot about their resilience. They went with their friends, and it's beautiful to see the ways the next generation may have strength I don't have. The weight of being a ground zero parent is enormous, yet it's the only way forward. The only way forward, yet the only way forward is to move into the pain. Similarly, I can imagine ways in which it was healing for Nick to put lament for his son together. He assembled the book like a fine carpenter working his craft, focusing on details and not trying to, not trying to do everything at once. His micro-focus is like sanding the pieces of Kintsugi. At that particular place, during a particular time, in a particular way, Nick was dealing with this pain. He does not make grandiose philosophical statements. He doesn't go macro. Like a good craftsman, he stays micro. His honest grappling led him to a certain kind of understanding of his own craft. 
writing that book led him in some ways to the goal. He's a good steward of his pain because of his craftsman's dedication to paying attention and telling the truth of what he experienced. Because he did this, others can easily connect with what he's done. His discipline as both a philosopher and craftsman allowed him to do something very difficult, to both experience the pain and at the same time tell us about it. That's very hard to do when you're in the middle of it. And it's something Frederick Buechner has done also. The final test of any work is, is it generative? Does it give life? Does it give birth in the reader's mind and life? A work that does this is a rare gift. Lament for a son does this. It's a book that endures. He didn't write the book and say, I'm all better now. Instead, he's lovingly and carefully holding the fragments and passing them on. So that's my chapter. This morning, Frederick Buechner has also held the fragments and passed them on. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, King, for being here. And you can ask me anything you want about what I just read or about Frederick Buechner. Um, but I want to ask you, would you comment to me? I mean, how did you experience what I just shared with you? Did, did it ring true? What rang true with you? Um, Love to hear any feedback. I mean, you're the first people that have ever heard it. I've just been, you know, laboring away in my face all that have ever heard any of this. Oh, it's the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> so I lost my husband three years ago. Um, my soulmate. And the grief is not done. But I appreciate your imagery because um, it's a, it, you gave me permission to say it's okay to not be okay mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that it will take time. And it's okay to take time. Um, I love that that ceramic Japanese way of taking gold and making something more valuable out of that which was broken. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do, is to try to claim that preciousness of our relationship that allows new life to spring forth in some way. It's not there yet. Yeah. You see little buds of growth, but nothing yet. Yeah. But thank you. That well, was so you helpful. For being vulnerable and sharing with us. Thank you. That's powerful. Sorry. Yeah, somebody else is back there. I'm usually not the microphone person. Again, like Pastor Ann was saying, thank you. I am currently, and have been for the past, going on two years now, beginning to process the complexities that surround mental illness, especially when it pertains to complex post-traumatic stress and uh, disorder, dealing with things from childhood. And as a creative soul myself, what you have shared tonight shines so much light on that. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <coughs> Uh, Maggie Rust had a professor in seminary. He used to say all the time, there is a lot of pain in the world. Absolutely. Pain is a universal thing. Okay. I shared more uh, this morning a story of great pain and 
Uh, one thing I didn't share about that is that every time I've shared that, people then tell me their stories. Um, I even had a, a person follow me into a men's room once to tell me about the death of his daughter. Uh -huh. And these are, these are the most intimate and precious gifts we can give to each other, to tell the real stories of who we are. So Frederick Buechner says it calls us to live in the depth. <coughs> and our whole world is oriented to live in the shadows. That's where, we, that's where we should go with each other. And that's what I think the stewardship of pain is all about. So thank you. Yeah. If I heard you correctly, I heard you addressing a lot of unresolved grief in our culture, uh, not only because of COVID and the lack of memorial services or the lack of right. seeing or, or yeah. just a funeral service. Yeah. Um, would you speak to some of the anger that you feel that might be rising in the culture because of unresolved grief? That's a, that's a great question, and, and certainly Nick gets at that. I mean, he's talking about how important it was that they touched the body, and so many of us lost loved ones during the pandemic and couldn't do that. We couldn't and even have a funeral. We couldn't do that. We were not permitted to do that. So I think, as you all know, there is incredible anger underlying, and, and it comes out on airplanes, for some bizarre reason that people misbehave or it comes out in grocery store lines or different places like that just crazy kind of stuff that's happening right now and i do think that much of it is rooted in an inability to lament to say things aren't the way they're supposed to be and we don't have the answer we don't have the solution but we can just recognize the sadness of it and the language for that when we don't have the words the language already exists it's in the Psalms mm -hmm. the, the ancient Hebrew people knew how to do this in ways that we don't we think we've progressed <laughs> they knew how to do that in ways that, that we don't so yeah I think that's really a good question and really profound yeah that you spoke about. I too, I lost my father during um, COVID. So there's this hole um, and we didn't get to have the funeral and do all of those things that we wanted to. So I appreciate what you shared. It was difficult. Um, also, um, in my work, um, we deal with what are called adverse childhood experiences basis so i really saw a connection with what you were saying because sometimes we expect people to just get over it and just perform differently and it doesn't happen that easily so what you said really resonated with me particularly as we work with folks who have and all of us have you know something that we've experienced but some more than others and it certainly has had an impact on uh, people's ability to thrive. So whenever you mention uh, in your conversation, I immediately made the connection to ACEs. And the third thing is, so in the last few years, I've been learning a lot about um, the history of the African American community, about racial trauma and racism. And a lot of times what I hear from people is, why don't you just get over it? And that's probably not the right response because whenever you think back on the hundreds of years of trauma, it's not that easily done. So what you said really kind of resonated with me too as well because I have conversations with my 90-year-old mother, my father who passed away, who was almost 90. And it wasn't until they were like in their 80s and 90s that they started sharing these stories with me. So I really didn't know about their experience and what it was like for them growing up in the Jim Crow South. But as I learned, that was traumatic for me. 
and I'm sure it was traumatic for them. And so the response that a lot of times what we hear is, you know, just get over it, and it's really not <coughs> one of those things that you just get over. And it's kind of like that broken uh, vessel that's really passed down to generation to generation, and hopefully um, from that something new can be um, something new can be made of that. So I really appreciate what you shared. Yeah, thanks, so, Tina. So two books that um, that I reference in other parts of this book and that I read as part of this. One is called The Deepest Well by Amy Burke Harris, and it is about um, child overcoming or healing the effects of childhood trauma, and it goes into the, the what are called the, the ACE test, the Childhood Experience Test. And so I share some of that in a different chapter. Um, and then the other book is My Grandmother's Hands, um, which is by someone whose name I always blow, but I think it's Remsum Manakam is the way to pronounce it. And he's a, um, he's a therapist who lives in Minneapolis. He's been on On Being. If you listen to On Being, there's a great episode with Krista Tippett. And um, he talks about generational trauma. And the evidence now is in that generational trauma, trauma that's passed down generationally, is not just emotional, but that it is actually physical, physiological, that it is imprinted in people's brains and in the, the synapses inside their brains. So I have a friend that is um, also one of Maggie Russ's former professors, Chuck DeGroat, who I also talked to as part of this book. But Chuck said, well, you know, in 100 years, we're going to have all this sorted out, and we'll know everything about the brain. But right now, it's just a huge mystery. But there, there are discoveries being made in brain science and how our brains actually work and how they are affected by trauma that are amazing. We're right in the middle of an amazing time where there's so much light being shed on that. So I appreciated that, Tina, thanks. Yeah. Well, you'll have a chance to speak with Jeff a little bit more at the book table if you like. I encourage you to pick up a copy of Reading, Reading Beekner, pick up some of the Beekner books, and also Crystal Hurd's uh, book on C.S. Lewis and Leadership. Um, what a beautiful way to finish our series this year on Listen to Your Life, because uh, it accentuates for us that that listening includes grief. Um, and it's a, it's a nice moment to finish uh, a year of lots of rich reflection, and it's a nice moment to have Jeff Monroe back with us. Um, also, please do greet uh, his wife Gretchen, who is joining us uh, from Michigan once, you get, uh, once we get done. But please join me again in thanking Jeff Monroe.